two, about two weeks ago, I read a very interesting news item uh, in the foreign pages of the newspapers. I think it was the Daily Graphic, if I'm not mistaken. And there was a very interesting story that came from India. Uh, there was this young man who was in love with a girl, and he was so much in love with a girl, and uh, uh, he decided to, to express his love in a very, very remarkable, unforgettable, profound uh, way. Uh, so he, he cut off his finger and wrapped it in, in a sheet or so and gave it to his family to go and give it to the girl as a sign of love. And, uh, and so the family, I mean, I, I don't think the family approved of him cutting his little finger, but uh, I think they wrapped the finger and, and, sh and, and took it to the girl's family uh, to show that this is uh, what your husband-to-be uh, believe you are worth. You are worth uh, his life. He's cut his finger for you. Needless to say, uh, when the girl saw the finger, she uh, discontinued the relationship uh, and, uh, and the girl's family totally uh, banned their daughter from marrying this man because uh, if this man is going to cut his finger at this time, you, you will not be sure what you'll be cutting uh, a few days from now. So uh, they just sensed that there was trouble along the way uh, and, and, and they discontinued the relationship. And that reminds me uh, when Tina Turner sang the song, What's Love Got to Do With This? I think people do a lot of crazy things out of love. Uh, people cut their finger. Uh, <laughs> I don't know what you did <laughs> or what you've been doing. Let's hope that you are, you are smarter than him. But love is a very, very a strong force and I think that the, the Bible captures the strength of love very profoundly when it says many waters cannot quench love it, it means it's stronger than fire and when it's burning it burns uh, without stopping and uh, it's, it's almost unquenchable when people are in love they lose their brains do you remember <laughs> or you are yet to be in love but when people are in love there's too much blood circulating around their brains uh, because of all the energy and the adrenaline that it short circuits their uh, thinking process so it's almost like an electrical malfunctioning and, and the whole thing blows, the wire touches somewhere in their brains and people start doing very, very crazy things. Um, but you and I know that love is more than that feeling. Uh, you wish that that feeling uh, would stay uh, forever, but it doesn't stay forever. Um, you get in love and then over some time you come to reality. And you begin to ask yourself, why did I fall in love in the first place? Because what you thought was an angel has metamorphosed <laughs> into a demon, demon-possessed entity who stares you in the face every day. I'm talking about learning to love, learning to love. You can fall in love, but I prefer that you stand in love. <laughs> and, and better still that you walk in love. Because when, when you, are, you fall into something, you are stuck. And um, you don't move. And learning to love is a process. There's so many things about love that we take for granted. Because we feel it, we think we understand it. Just because we feel it doesn't mean we understand it. And so many things make us fall in love or feel love. 
Sometimes it is based on our own unmet needs. Somebody shows up and the person seems to meet that need and all of a sudden your heart begins to flutter and um, the chemicals begin to roll in and when the chemicals are rolling they spoil the case because the chemicals stop you from thinking and so you go in on chemical power for a very long time and then when the chemical dries up you come to reality and sometimes reality can be very very horrifying and, and that's why sometimes people love people and, and do bad things to them. Uh, there are people who love and end up destroying the people they love. People love people and kill them. People love people and beat them up. People love people and, and terrorize their lives, harass them. He asked the man, why, why are you always checking your wife or your fiance's telephone why are you always reading her text message from your phone they say i'm in love <laughs> love will make you work with the telecom corporation <laughs> but very soon Love is going to lead to something and normally it leads into marriage. And then other things take over and life can be very, very tough. So why is it that sometimes we have difficulty keeping the love that we began with? The first one is unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations. Each one of us has got expectations in life. Expectations basically are the things you expect, the things you hope to see or you hope to happen. And the things you hope to see are based on so many factors. Some of it is based on books you have read, films you have watched, lives you have observed, stories people have told you. All of these create expectation for you. If you read Romeo and Juliet, um, you, you, you would have an expectation of love. Romeo, oh Romeo, you know, and uh, you see Juliet up there in the window and crying to Romeo, uh, his love. And so uh, if you're a very romantic person, that becomes your expectation that you fall in love and you be standing in the window and say, Kwame, oh Kwame, my love. Because Romeo and Juliet creates an expectation. You read, uh, for a lot of you girls, Mills and Boone, it creates expectations for you. And then you watch the movies all the nice romantic movies and they create expectation for you. The Sound of Music. My wife has watched Sound of Music about 10,000 times. The, the night of her marriage, she was watching Sound of Music. Afterwards, she's been watching Sound of Music and she's infected our home with Sound of Music. And all our children like watching Sound of Music. So, uh, uh, last year, when I traveled, I saw that they had released a very special version of Sound of Music. I think it's the 40, 50th or 40-something anniversary of the Sound of Music, because by the way, Sound of Music was made in about 1959, so it's a very old movie, and they had released uh, a commemorative Sound of Music, and it had interviews of all the little girls and boys in Sound of Music who are now grown and telling their story and all that. So I said, this is the best thing to buy my wife. This is a specialist of Sound of Music. So I bought a Sound of Music and since it came, the sound has been sounding. <laughs> but I'm sure she had some expectation uh, and I hope that uh, she's not too disappointed. 
But people watch movies and they create expectations. Expectations are good, but sometimes expectations can be unrealistic. That means that in life, you have to deal with what you have and what you want. Say with me, what I have and what I want. Now, sometimes the gap between what you have and what you want can be very wide. Uh, or sometimes the gap can be very narrow. Or sometimes what you have will be what you want. But there are people who have, but they don't want what they have. They want something else. And when you have a big gap between what you have and what you want, your expectations become unfulfilled. And in a relationship, that can create a lot of problems. So expectations are important, but when they become unrealistic, when we don't bring our expectations to, to, to come to the reality of what we are dealing with, we can destroy our love with unrealistic expectations. Unrealistic expectations come in different forms. It comes in the form of unrealistic dreams. Unrealistic dreams. You know, um, one of the things uh, you, as a pastor you, you get to do is you officiate weddings. And you can always tell when people are having weddings and the wedding is their dream wedding. You know, some people come to have wedding and you know that this person is just having a wedding. But others to have a wedding and you know that this is the dream. This is what the person has imagined for a very long time. And I remember when the film, the movie Coming to America became popular. I remember Coming to America, Eddie Murphy. And uh, you remember when uh, his so-called African parent, the king, came, they were sprinkling petals, you know, and, uh, in, and on the street for him and so on. So I was officiating this wedding and Coming to America had just become very popular. And uh, they were having the wedding and um, they, they had the petal thing to do but you know normally when you're having a wedding and you're doing the petals at least you know when the congregation is a lot it makes it look nice so you walk the lady walks in the aisle and it's so beautiful everybody's standing but I was doing this wedding and the people were not filling the auditorium and it was just a few people it was not in this auditorium it's in another place so don't worry uh, <laughs> so so the people were just in the front, about one or two seats. And, and so they, they had to get a full hall to make the dream come true. But people too had not come. So they kept delaying the whole thing. Pastor, just wait. Pastor, just wait. So I waited and waited. After one hour, the thing was still not full. I said, hey, if I don't officiate it, I'm gone. So they had to do it. So they brought this girl, flower girl, to be sprinkling the petal. And she didn't know how to sprinkle it. So the petal was going into the pews and all, all of that. And, 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 and then finally the bride came and I could see from the face of the bride her dream has been shattered. Because what she dreamt her wedding day would become was not how it became. That can be the beginning of trouble. Because when people's dreams are not met, Sometimes they become very angry and they, they start blaming other people and they, it sets the wrong tone for life. So unrealistic expectations sometimes is unrealistic dreams. Dreams that are formulated by somebody borrowed by us which never become a reality. Sometimes unrealistic expectations can be in the form of unrealistic standards unrealistic standards and I, I tell young ladies especially and listen to me very carefully young ladies young ladies attract people how many of you know that okay all right <laughs> okay and I know some of you are saying pastor no 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 you lie they attract so by the time you're about 21, 22, 23, it, you are hitting your peak as a lady. 
Now, when you start attracting people, sometimes you can also get very, very pompous because everybody likes you. So for some ladies, they start raising the bar. It's like the high jump. Now, contestants are many, so they start raising the bar from four feet to five, to six feet, to seven feet, to eight feet. Now, nobody can jump it because they feel they'll be young forever. So they take it to eight feet, and all the men look around and say, hey, listen, we can't jump this. So they start moving one by one. They move, they move, they move. Unrealistic standards. It could be standards of, I want a man who has his own house. How many young people are 25, 27 have their own house? If he's not Michael Jackson, he doesn't have his own house. I want somebody who has his own, and, and I mean, in other civilizations, by 21 people have cars. In Ghana, people buy cars at 40. So, <laughs> so you have unrealistic expectations, so you set unrealistic standards. What happens is, for the young ladies, you have a biological clock. That means that if you don't marry and have children early, having children becomes difficult. So if you raise the standard high, you hit 28, 29, 30, then you see that mm, it's getting dangerous. So you, read, you reduce it from number eight to seven. You look around, six, nobody's coming. Five, nobody's coming. Four, nobody's coming. Oh, three, two, one. So eventually, you end up marrying something. <laughs> so don't set the standards too high. Be realistic. Be realistic. You start life together. All right? Unrealistic standards. Unrealistic standards can come in so many different forms. Even for married couple, we set unrealistic standards for each other. If you are married to a typical, <laughs> typical Ghanaian, typical, the man has lived all his life at Jamestown. You don't expect such a man to give you flowers on Valentine's Day. Just forget about flowers. You can expect kinky and fish, but not flowers. So, let the standards be realistic. <laughs> because if you don't set realistic standards, you will be disappointed. And really, the disappointments we have in life are not based on reality. They are based on expectations. Because if you create expectations for yourself and they are not met, you'll be disappointed. So it's not the reality that disappoints you. It's because your expectation has been punctured. You thought you would marry a nice Romeo and this guy is a typical gun boy. He has a lot of degrees, but he's still typical. Or typical Fanti, by the way. Anyway. Unrealistic expectations take the form of unrealistic demands. So sometimes we demand things, we demand attention, we demand support, we demand help from very unrealistic standards. And you have to know that Nobody can meet all your needs for you. If you can't survive as a single person, marriage will not solve your problems. It can't. It may even complicate your problems. 
if your father didn't give you attention, you can't expect your husband to be your father. He's not your father. He's not that old. <laughs> if your mother didn't give you attention, she's not your mother. She's not that old. So it's an unrealistic demand that we have to watch. The second major reason why sometimes we're not able to sustain our relationships is what I call the myth of the greener pasture. The myth of the greener pasture. What do I mean by the myth of the greener pasture? It is the thinking that it is better somewhere. It is better somewhere. If only I had married the other person, it would have been better. Look at the other people. Look at how they are. Why can't we be like them? It's called the myth of the greener pasture. You think the greener, the pasture is greener outside your marriage or outside of your relationship. You go there and you just see that it looks green, but it was just painted green. <laughs> it's just as dry as yours, but it's been camouflaged with green paint. It's not real. Most of the time, what we compare our own lives with are not real. And then you, 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 you sometimes look up to people and find out that you are better than those people you are looking up to. And all of us, men and women, sometimes think it's better somewhere. Why do you think people marry and have affairs because they think it's better somewhere. They think some man is better, some woman is better. And then they get in there and realize they are the same. Little variations, but it's still Toyota. <laughs> One is Camry, the other is Karina, but it's still Toyota. Same thing. So don't create a myth that is better somewhere. The life somebody has it better than yours, you want yours to be better. When we create the myth of a greener pasture, we postpone our pleasure. We say things like, if only I had money. And then you have the money and you realize money doesn't solve the problem. If only we had children, you have the children. If only because a myth is not a reality. And for those of you who are courting or looking around, who feel too good about yourself, you believe you are the best thing that happened since the electric toaster. There is none like you, no, not one. And so you start moving with somebody and then you get bored and you see somebody else and start moving with them. Sometimes you find people jumping from one person to the other, from one person to the other, hoping that the next person will be better and then realizing that the next person is like the last person. Human beings are different, but human beings are also the same. There is the sameness of our humanity and there is the uniqueness of our humanity. But at the bottom of it, we are all the same. All men are men. All women are women. The difference may be size, shape, color, but it's the same Toyota, same man. <laughs> same thing. So don't create myths for yourself, especially for those of you who have found people that you've made a commitment to with your life. You've married. You, you, you have to hold on. If you create myths, you will always seek to go out. People create myths and say, if only I had married someone else. If only I had married someone else. So many people propose to me. So many girls like me. I don't even know why I chose this one. If only you had married somebody else. I can guarantee you, if you had married that somebody else, you will still be saying, if only I had married this one. It's not better out there. 
It's the same. If you don't make it work for you, it's not going to work. Sometimes you may see somebody and think, well, I wish that was my wife or that was my husband. Have you asked whether they wish you were their husband or wife? <laughs> Just because you wish it doesn't mean they also wish it. They may not like you, although you may like them. It's a myth that the grass is greener somewhere. Life is better with somebody else. If only we had what they had, if we had the house they had, if we had the car they had, if we had the income they had. And all of us struggle with that. But you have to come to a place of certainty to make what you have work. Third, misunderstanding the role of conflict. Misunderstanding the role of conflict. Sometimes I hear couples say, we've been married for 30 years, 20 years, and we've never had a com conflict. I say, thank God, I don't know which planet you live on, but um, <laughs> if you live on this planet, conflict is part and parcel of life. I think sometimes people don't have conflict because they are afraid to offend. Or one person decides to swallow everything that the other person gives out. Most times you have no conflict because the wife swallows everything. The man misbehaves, talks, does whatever, but she has decided because when she was going to marry, the mother told her, when you go to marry, stay. Put water in your mouth and close your mouth. Don't talk. So yes, you can have a quarrel-free, conflict-free relationship. But guaranteed, through life, you have conflict. The problem is not a conflict, it's how you deal with conflict. As a matter of fact, conflict is necessary for growth and maturity and development. Sometimes, people who don't like conflict, the first conflict they have they think they've made the wrong choice. And from then, they decide this is a wrong relationship. Many times when you talk to marriages and people who are having problem in the marriage, and you ask, when did this begin? They have a beginning point, and they will tell you the beginning point. At this time, this happened, and we had this quarrel, and from that time, things have not worked. Because most time when people have a conflict, they begin to think that they have made a wrong choice. But conflict is necessary. It's important. It matures you. I have been married almost 20 years now. Time flies, I can tell you. Just a few weeks ago, I was saying I do. 20 years. Have we had conflict? Oh, yes. But pastor, you are anointed. We've had anointed conflicts. <laughs> but what has it done? It's matured me. And I hope it's matured my wife too. I've grown. She has grown. When I married my wife, she was extremely, extremely, Extremely withdrawn and quiet. I'm quiet myself. But she was quieter than me. <laughs> very, very quiet. Never wanted to come out to do anything. The only people my wife conversed with in those days are either her friends from school, her brothers and sisters, or me. That's all. She wasn't very outgoing. Extremely quiet. And it used to frustrate me. The reason it used to frustrate me was because I grew up under a system where 
you know, most pastors had their wives who were also preachers. You know, uh, T.L. Osborne's wife, Kenneth Hagin and his wife, Copeland and his wife, and all the people I considered spiritual heroes, their wives would come and, hey, honey, and my wife said this, and my wife said that, and I said, hey, my wife too, you, should, you too, you should be able to stand there and say something. <laughs> you too say, do something. <laughs> So, I tried to make her do things and she just didn't like them. I said, do that? She says, I don't have interest in that. And I didn't. So I said, finally, I decided I'm not going to tell her to do anything. I'm going to accept what I have. And if she never does anything, I'll be happy with her. If she never says any word, but she will talk to me, I'm fine. <laughs> if she never gets active in the church, I'm fine. So I stopped putting pressure. We didn't discuss it. We just lived our lives in love. I just, I just, I said I married a wife. I didn't marry a preacher. If I wanted a preacher, I should have gone to the seminary to pick one. I got this one not from seminary. So, why do I want her to be something else? Why do I want to change her? Why do I want to push her beyond what she thinks she can do? So I leave her. I prayed, I said, Lord, whatever you want her to be, I'm fine. I don't care what other people's wives do. I just want my wife to be my wife and that's all. Nothing more, nothing less. So we went on 10 years, 15 years, and she started doing a few things. So, well, let's see. She started doing one here and one there, and she started organizing this and organizing that. Then all of a sudden, I began to see something I never thought she had. Great organizational skills. I never thought it. She was good in the kitchen. <laughs> Honestly. My wife, in terms of our home, she's extremely organized to the frustration of everybody in the house. <laughs> I'm telling you, in our home, if I don't think any family in Ghana can beat us, When it comes to some things, like brushing your teeth, we are the champions. In our family, we brush our teeth. In the morning, everybody's going. Ja, 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 ja. <laughs> and that's from my wife. Everybody, you have to brush. So we brush our teeth. You, we have about two or three toothpaste. You finish with this one, you go to this one, you go to that one. Oh yeah, I'm telling you the truth. You don't brush with just one toothpaste. This one does one, this one does this, this one for the tongue, this one for the teeth, this one is for brighting. At least you have to brush about four times in the morning before you leave. So she's very organized. <laughs> <laughs> extremely organized <laughs> so I had to learn I, I when I was growing up you know we didn't have time for brushing teeth you just throw the sponge in your mouth and <laughs> off you go but uh, we had to learn new habits so she started organizing I knew she was a good organizer I knew she was very meticulous and very perfect with everything she does but I didn't think she could do it on a large scale. But she began to move into her space. Now people will look at me and say, oh, look at Pastor Otebel's wife. Look at the way she supports the wife, husband, and look at all that she's doing. Do you know how long it took <laughs> for that to happen? You like the end product, but I have to show you the process. 
And the process was not pushing. The process was being patient, trusting her, believing in her, accepting her the way she is. I said, I'm not going to change her. I don't want her to be like me. Then it came to preaching. So she started preaching. But anytime she's preaching, she warned me, don't come close. I don't want you to be around because I'll be nervous. So she started preaching and people come and tell me, your wife is a great preacher. I said, hmm. <laughs> but over time, she started growing and developing. And when my wife is going to preach, she works hard. Like somebody doing wala to wala I mean, this, I mean, she works. I mean, she doesn't sleep. And I tell her, listen, you're, you're not going to fight. You're, this is just preaching. You're good. I say, but I have to prepare and make sure everything is perfect. I say, listen, go. If nobody knows what you want to say, if you go and say, Baba, black sheep, they'll think you are anointed to say that. Just say something. But she had to prepare and prepare and prepare. And you know, when your wife is preparing, you can't stop. So I have to sit with her throughout the night. Very obediently, because if you go to sleep, you have trouble. So you have to stay up. If you go to sleep, you're in trouble for months. So, so. So I said, if you want me to keep awake, I will keep awake. I'm dozing and keeping awake. So, so what does this mean? I said, well, it means so and so. And I take my time to explain everything I know. He says, but I don't like it. I said, but why did you ask me in the first place? You want my opinion. So the first time she preached here in church, it was a lot of work. But she did go, didn't she? Yes. And after she finished preaching, people came to tell me, your, pa- your wife has to preach every Sunday. You have to preach every Sunday. I said, do you know how much it costs to get one message out of this lady? <laughs> every Sunday, I'll never sleep for the rest of my life. <laughs> but you know, it, it just tells you that People, when they are allowed to be themselves, grow better than when you put pressure on them to become something else. And most of the conflicts we have in marriage is because we are trying so hard to make our wives or our husbands in our own image. We are trying so hard. The man has to be Romeo. The man has to be Captain Von Trapp, the man has to be. And, and, and the guy can't. He may become, if you give him space. She may become, if you give her space. One of the things I can tell you, if you want your marriage to work, you have to be comfortable with the person you are married to. You have to be comfortable with them. You have to be at peace, at ease with them, with who they are. And don't measure them or compare them with anybody. If you are a wife, don't compare your husband to the pastor. Say, look at pastor. You see the way pastor was talking about his wife? You you come there, you can't talk about it. You can't talk about it. (laughs) <laughs> that's a comparison because he is not pastor and pastor is not your husband so leave your husband to be himself he's not pastor Mesa Otabel leave him because some of you will go home and say do you see the way pastor is talking you see you see <laughs> you see the way you too You want your husband to be pastor? 
if your husband becomes pastor, he comes and stands in this pulpit, there will be scatter in the house of God. <laughs> but you leave him to be who he is. People grow. Everybody say grow. Because you know, when, when people are even choosing marriage partners, they don't factor growth into it. And when you don't factor growth, you can't see how people will become. You only see who they are now. But people grow. People mature. People understand better. People become better. I am a far, far better, a better version of this Toyota. This one is a high spec, fully loaded specimen of a basic one 20 years ago. But through studying the word of God, through my own submission to the Holy Spirit, because as I submit to God, God allows my nature to be refined. And when God refines my nature, it influences my relationships. But if I don't submit to the Holy Spirit, my nature will not be refined. If I have rough edges, I grow with my rough edges and live with rough edges for life. Because the only one who changes people is the Holy Spirit. He is the only one who changes. He's the only one who turns lives around. And if we allow him to work on us, we become better people. Amen? Amen? So we can learn to love. Love doesn't happen automatically. You say, Pastor, have you learned anything? I have learned so many things about women. <laughs> Sometimes I see some men, I say, hey, the way you are going, you'll be in trouble. Because when you deal with women and you're a man, you have to be extra smart. Because, you know, some, some men are so fundamental, so basic. They say, well, you know, I asked my wife, do you like it? And she said, no. And then I say, if you don't like it, then I'll do, I'll do. I, I. You don't understand the language of women. I asked my wife, are you, are you hurt? And she said, no, I'm not hurt. So I said, okay, then I, I left. Hey, are you crazy? <laughs> you need to go to tutorials. You need to be taught how to decode feminine language. <laughs> oh, yeah. I, I hear men say that, you know, and, and I said, well, sweetheart, what's the problem? Tell me and we will solve it. And she said, there's no problem. And I said, okay. <laughs> <laughs> when a woman tells you okay there's no problem it means the problem is so big I can't talk about it now <laughs> it's so big when she says no problem go and pray <laughs> when you ask your wife so I see you are moody is there anything wrong nothing Go and kneel down. <laughs> Lift up your hands to heaven and say, Lord God Jehovah, open my eyes. Because when she says nothing, you are in trouble. When she says something, thank God, hallelujah. But when she says nothing, why are you, why are you sad? There's nothing. Why are you so quiet? Nothing. So when we were in church and, and I, I said that I saw your faith has changed. Uh, uh, so were you disturbed? Oh, no. <laughs> Only an unintelligent man <laughs> would say, oh, yeah, she says no. Oh, oh, my wife, oh, she was not bothered. I even asked her whether she was troubled. She said no. <laughs> you, you haven't learned the codes. It means the matter is so heavy. We can't talk about it. So I had to learn that. So when my wife says, no problem, it didn't bother me. I said, Lord, thank you, Jesus. I need help, Lord. And you have to employ 
all the skills at your disposal to diffuse all the bombs. You're diffusing the bombs. You diffuse. One of the things you have to learn to do is to smile. Put your arm around her. Give her a kiss. And she say, hey, take your hand off. But when she say, take your hand off, you put your hand there. <laughs> I don't like that. Oh, put your hand there. Uh, get her. Put your hand there. Because the moment she says, I don't like that. Oh, the ice is breaking. <laughs> when she says, no problem. There's cold war. When she says, I don't like that all, oh, then you know we are winning the battle. <laughs> Things are changing. <laughs> now, I know some of you men are very hard. <laughs> very, very hard. You were raised by hard soldier, soldier men. <laughs> so very hard and you only know how to shout and scream and stomp your feet hey, 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 hey. I'm telling you read the book of Proverbs it will tell you when a woman decides to give you trouble it says you have to you, it's better for you to go and live in the corner of your house <laughs> Your own house, you'll be in the corner. <laughs> Some of you men, you are in the corner of your house. It's because you don't know how to handle the women. Because women look weak, but they are very, very powerful. Powerful. But it takes understanding to deal with these things. We have to learn not to rush people to be who we want them to be. Amen? Now, some of you here are not married and uh, you are looking. Watch and pray. What is the next sentence? That you do not enter into temptation. <laughs> That's what Jesus said. Watch and pray that you do not enter into temptation. That means if you don't watch and pray, you will enter into trouble. So whilst you are praying, watch. Watch doesn't mean watch her dress and watch the way she walks. Oh, oh that's nice. <laughs> no, that's not what you are watching for. You are watching for more than that. You are watching for value systems. You are watching for priorities. You are watching for dreams. You are watching for expectations. When people start talking big, big, big before they marry, trouble. Because the expectations are so big, you can't meet it. If a man tells you, ask for me, I want my wife to be like this. And the woman says, ask for me, I want my husband to be like that. Trouble watch for that when people start placing strong demands on what they expect they can easily be disappointed so well we've said a few things about love today and I hope that uh, you will not go and cut your finger <laughs> and give it to any person but you will learn to grow in love and uh, be able to build your relationships well especially for those of you who are married um, I, I trust that your marriage will work. I pray that it works. And um, God will help you, but you also need to make some adjustments. For those of you who are not married, I pray that you would make the right choices when they come. For those of you who are not looking to choose, because some of you have decided, I won't marry. Um, a 
a few people have decided they won't marry. Maybe they are too old, or they are too hurt, or they are too disappointed, so they say, I won't marry. If that's your situation, make sure that you live right before God. Because living alone has its lonely moments, which lead to all kinds of pressure. So if you're taking that path, then you know that you can handle the pressure <laughs> by the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. But if you also want to marry and the people don't come, <laughs> because husband is not like mango that you can pluck or wife is not like mango you can pluck. If they don't come, live your life. Because believe you me, before Eve came, Adam was living his life. And he got a lot done all by himself. So you can also get a lot done all by yourself. You don't need necessarily to marry to live a better life. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for making time to listen to Living Word. To correspond with Dr. Mensa Autobill, please write to Living Word, International Central Gospel Church, PO Box 7933, Accra, Ghana. Telephone 233-21-688-000. Fax 233-21-688-007. Email autobill at centralgospel.com. For further information on other messages by Dr. Mensa Otterville, please email tapes at centralgospel.com and visit www.centralgospel.com. Oh, 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 o